Okay, so in the last class we discussed the elixir of Iden bomb, and if you recall, uh, the first thing we did with it was we put uh, a qubit in at angle epsilon, and then it went through, and we saw that if it's a dud, then it'll simply pass through at angle epsilon. But on the other hand, if there's a bomb, there's a slim chance of an explosion, uh, sine epsilon squared, but if the bomb doesn't explode, then the qubit is measured and it comes out at angle zero. So after we discussed this in class, a couple of students came up to me and asked me a very perceptive question. They said, well, since uh, the qubit has come out now and it's in state zero if it's a bomb and it's a state uh, angle epsilon if it's a dud, you know, maybe we can just tell the difference between these two states. Why do we have to sort of repeat this process many times uh, to change the angle between them to be uh, 90 degrees? And it's a very perceptive question and it uh, leads us to this uh, discussion of this problem called uh, the problem of discriminating quantum states. Okay, so this is a general task. Imagine you're given an unknown state psi, uh, and you're promised that this state psi is either u or v, where u and v are two states that you know, mathematical descriptions of. Uh, you just don't know whether psi is u or psi is v. And your task is to take this unknown state psi and do something with it, and eventually try to guess whether it was in state u or state v. So let me make it a little bit more general and space them out. There's u, there's v. So imagine you know these two states, psi is in one of these two states, and you have to tell the difference. Well, uh, we know how to do two things so far in quantum. We know that you can apply a unitary transformation of your choice, and you can also measure. So imagine you apply a unitary transformation to the unknown state psi. Well, this is basically a rotation, you know, a rotation or a reflection. And one thing that we saw is that if you apply a unitary transformation to uh, state psi, um, it preserves its length, and it also preserves the angles between any two states. And basically this means um, you can rotate uh, psi in such a way that u and v become any two states that you prefer that have the same angle theta as they initially had. As we'll see, this problem of discriminating quantum states, it basically only depends on the angle theta between u and v, assuming u and v are qubit states with real amplitudes. So one thing we can do is um, apply a unitary transformation so that u and v are as pictured in the diagram. Uh, specifically, their bisector is at angle 45 degrees. You know, we set them up so the bisector is at this 45 degree angle uh, between the two axes. Okay, and that'll be useful for us. So uh, the other thing that you can do is measure the qubit psi in some basis. So let's imagine that after we rotate things so that u and v, the uh, states that we know psi is in, either u or v, uh, the angle bisector is, the bisector of them is at 45 degrees. Let's imagine we measure in the standard basis, okay, which is pictured here, the basis of zero and one. And, you know, just by looking at the diagram, it seems like a good strategy that if the readout turns out to be zero, then we should probably guess that the state psi was in state v. And on the other hand, if the readout was one, well, it's reasonable to guess that psi was in state u. Okay, so that will be our little algorithm. And uh, it's not always correct. It has some error. And let's try to figure out what the error of this algorithm is. So suppose first that psi was equal to u. So when do we make an error? We make an error when we guess v, and we guess v when the readout is zero. So in other words, when psi really is u, uh, the probability of the error is the probability that we'll read out zero. And as we all know, this is the cosine of this, the square of the cosine of the angle between u and zero. Okay, so the angle between u and zero is not theta. That's the angle between u and v. The angle between u and zero is uh, some gamma. And if you think about it for uh, a second, uh, this angle gamma is 45 degrees plus half of theta. Okay, so the error probability is the cosine squared of 45 degrees plus half of theta. And a uh, tiny trigonometric identity uh, that you can think about for yourself tells us that another way to express the same probability is a half minus a half uh, times sine of theta. Okay, so the probability of making an error when psi is really u, we're guessing v, is a half minus a half times sine theta. And here's a little plot of that. The horizontal axis is theta, and the vertical axis is the probability of error. And you can see, of course, that if uh, theta is really close to zero, so u and v are very close, they're very similar states, if you will, 
and the probability of error is close to a half. And that makes sense because if they're very close, maybe this algorithm has only close to a 50-50 chance of getting the right answer. Whereas if their angle is close to perpendicular, close to 90 degrees, then the probability of error goes down to close to zero. And in fact, if u and v are at angle of 90 degrees, then this error algorithm can have uh, error zero. In that case, uh, u would be one and v would be zero. I mean, the states uh, one and zero. And measuring in the standard basis will allow you to perfectly discriminate them. And actually, that's what we set up at the end of the elitzer weidmann baum algorithm that we saw. We arranged so that uh, at the end of this many repetitions, the dud state was one and the bomb state was zero, and then we could perfectly tell the difference, assuming we didn't explode. Uh, I should mention by symmetry, if, if psi happens to be v, then we make an error if we guess u, which is when the readout is one, and it's a symmetric uh, situation. So in this case, the error also has probability uh, half minus half Einstein beta. Now I should mention, this is a two-sided error algorithm. We see when the true answer is u, we make some error with probability half minus half sine theta. And also when the true answer is v, we may have some chance of error half minus a half sine theta. Okay, so uh, if you recall in homework one, we talked about the difference between two-sided error algorithms and one-sided error algorithms and zero-sided error algorithms. So in fact, let's think about this. Uh, let's think about the possibility of having a one-sided error algorithm. Okay, so this is an algorithm that has um, like a no false positive property. Okay, so uh, one thing you could do for this is instead of measuring in the zero one basis, you could measure in the basis of u and u perp, where u perp is whatever vector happens to be perpendicular 90 degrees to u. Okay, and let's see what happens if you measure in this basis rather than in the standard basis. Should first say what is the remainder of the algorithm. First of all, if the readout is u, then let's say we guess u. And on the other hand, if the measurement readout is u perp, then we should guess v. And actually, um, that's a very good situation because you see if the if psi really is u, then the chance of the measuring device reading out u perp is zero. Uh, so if you get a measurement readout of u perp, then it definitely has to be v. So you can guess v with full confidence in that case. In other words, we're gonna have a situation where uh, in one case, there'll be zero error. So let's take a look at that. So suppose psi is u, suppose the truth of the matter is that psi is u, then um, the readout will certainly be u with 100% probability. And in that case, we guess u, that's this case here. And so when psi happens to be u, the probability of us making an error is zero. On the other hand, uh, so suppose psi is v, then uh, we'll make an error if we guess u, and we guess u when the readout is u. So in other words, we make an error when um, you know, psi is v, but the readout is u. So that's what's the chance, the chance of that is the chance that uh, measuring v will produce the outcome u. And as we know, that's the cosine of the angle between v and u, which is by definition theta. Okay, so the probability of error in, in the case when psi is v is cosine of theta squared. And just for ease of comparison to the previous case, I actually wrote that as one minus the square of sine theta. Okay, so when psi is u, we have no error. When psi is v, uh, we have this error one minus sine squared theta. Um, just to be clear, I mean, you can think of this as the opposite way. If we made some readout and uh, it was u perp and we guessed v, that's also a case where we have no error, where we're sure it's it really is v. So if we say that uh, v is what we call a quote unquote positive, uh, you know, maybe that's the bomb case, then this is a no false positives algorithm. Okay, this is the kind of one-sided error algorithm with no false positives. We never guess, if we, sorry, if we guess v, then uh, we're never making a mistake. Okay, so this is a very nice uh, thing, result in that it has one-sided error, but you see, Suppose that we do this in the elitzer weidmann uh, bomb scenario right after we put the qubit in for the first time when theta is epsilon. In that case, this probability of um, having a, f a false negative is one minus sine epsilon squared. And sine epsilon squared is actually the same as the probability of us exploding. So there's a certain sense in which 
you know, if you stop the Litzer Weidman bomb algorithm there, you haven't really made any progress. You know, your error probability is the same as your explosion probability. So that's another reason why we do this strategy of repeating 90 degrees over epsilon time. Finally, let me just show you the picture here of this uh, uh, error probability. You see, it's, it's worse in the sense that when uh, theta is very close to zero, so u and v are very similar states, um, the probability of making an error is very close to one. And that's because um, you know, we're obliging ourselves to have only one-sided error. So it's, it's naturally harder than allowing ourselves two-sided error. But on the other hand, as theta tends to 90 degrees and u and v, the two states we're trying to discriminate, become perpendicular, then the error probability again goes down to zero. Okay, so we've seen two-sided error and we've also thought about uh, one-sided error. What about zero-sided error? Okay, so this is the kind of algorithm where now um, the algorithm has three different possible guesses. It can guess that the state psi is u, it can guess that the state psi is v, or it's allowed to simply say, I don't know. Okay, and I don't know is considered to be the error here. And to be zero-sided means to say that um, you're never allowed to be wrong. If you guess that it's z, u, it really has to be u. And if you guess that it's v, it really has to be v. And um, you know, you're trying to minimize the probability that you say, I don't know. Now, as we've just seen, we have a no false positives algorithm. Let's say v is called positive. And by symmetry, we can have an equally good no false negatives algorithm. That would be if we measured in the v and v perp basis. So we have these two one-sided error algorithms. And whenever you have that scenario, you can actually combine uh, them into a zero-sided error, error algorithm as follows. So here's the zero-sided error algorithm that suggests itself. Flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, or in other words, with probability half, do your no false positives algorithm. And if it comes up tails, do your no false negatives algorithm. Okay? And if you recall, when you do, let's say, the no false positives algorithm, there's one case, namely when you're guessing v, where you're sure you're right. And the other case, when you're guessing u, maybe you're not sure if you're right. Okay, so in this zero-sided error algorithm, um, whether you're doing the false positive or the false negative uh, test, whenever you're about to give an answer that you're sure of, go, go ahead and do so, guess that. On the other hand, if you're about to give the answer you're not sure of, sure of then instead say, I don't know. Okay, and the good thing about doing this 50-50 uh, do the false positives or do the false negatives test is, well, whatever psi is, be it u or v, you have a 50% chance of guessing uh, the appropriate test for that. And then in that case, you are sometimes sure of the answer. Okay, and other times uh, you're forced to output, don't know. Okay, so in fact, you can compute the overall probability that this zero-sided error algorithm outputs don't know. And um, it sort of starts with a half because there's a half chance that you sort of guess the wrong uh, test, the false positive, no false positives or no false negatives test based on what psi happened to actually be, be it u or v, there's a 50% chance that you'll pick the one where you're never sure of the case that psi is. So that's, uh, you have a 50% chance right away. And then with the remaining 50% chance, you basically pick up the error of the one-sided algorithm. Okay, so if we plug in what we know about the error of the one-sided algorithm, one-sided error algorithm, we can say that the final quote unquote error for the zero-sided algorithm or the probability that the zero-sided algorithm you know, is forced to say I don't know is this expression one minus the square of sine theta divided by two, okay, which is larger. Okay, so in fact, this is the plot here of this uh, expression, one minus sine theta squared over two. Okay, and again, if you know theta is close to zero, so you and V are very similar, then you have a very high chance of having to output you don't know, but it improves as theta becomes larger. So let's summarize, and I put up the three plots over here. Uh, let's say we're trying to discriminate between two states that are at an angle of theta, u and v. We saw three tests, the two-sided error test in red, and it has this error probability, but it has the you know, deficit that um, whether psi is u or v, you have a chance of making an error. Uh, the more stringent thing is a one-sided error test that's in blue. And for your favorite choice of either u and v, you can arrange that in one case, whether if, if say psi is u, you'll never make a mistake. And in the other case, 
say one psi is v, you have some chance of making a mistake, and it's one minus times eta squared. And uh, the last most stringent kind of algorithm is the zero-sided error discrimination algorithm, which never you know, wrongly identifies the psi, but has some chance, the green chance, of saying, I don't know. Now, there's one thing here that might strike you as odd about the zero-sided error test, and it's concerned with this point right here. So the zero-sided error algorithm that I suggested has the property that when theta is 90 degrees, in other words, when u and v, the states you're trying to discriminate, are perpendicular, it still makes an error, that is to say, says, I don't know, with probability 50%. And there's something unnecessary about that, because you see, uh, if u and v are actually at 90 degrees, they're orthogonal, then you can actually discriminate them perfectly with no error whatsoever. You simply measure in the uv basis, since u and v are orthogonal, you can do that, and then you know exactly whether psi is u or v. And what that tells us, actually, is that this green curve is actually not optimal. The zero-sided error discrimination algorithm I described is not the optimal one. The two-sided and one-sided error ones I described actually are optimal. There is, in fact, a better thing you can do in the zero-sided error case, and it turns out that the best uh, success probability is achieved by an algorithm which says don't know with probability cosine theta. Okay, so it's still worse than the one-sided and uh, two-sided error bounds, but it has the correct property that as theta gets close to 90 degrees down here, the probability of saying don't know becomes zero. You might ask, how do you do this zero-sided error test? Well, it turns out actually um, we can't yet describe how to do it. In order to implement this test, you need one more uh, ingredient that you're allowed to do. Namely, you actually need to introduce a new quantum particle, a new qubit into the picture, making your state four-dimensional, and then do a unitary transformation on this four-dimensional space, and then do a four-dimensional measurement of the two particles, the one you introduced and the initial one psi that you're trying to discriminate. And actually, this is a good leading to our next lecture in which we'll talk about multi-qubit systems and multi-qubit uh, unitary transformations and multi-qubit measurements.